Well, today is a day to celebrate because we have the first human captured images of our black hole, Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, excuse me, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. You might notice it looks a bit familiar uh, compared with the image of the black hole that was resolved uh, not too terribly long ago. Future Brian's going to look up that date and put some information about it on the screen here. But this is amazing because we, we now have a direct image of this black hole, the supermassive black hole, that we have been pretty confident is at the center of our galaxy, that we're actually pretty confident there's one at the center of pretty much every galaxy, as far as I understand how the theory goes. But now we have a direct uh, observation of this phenomenon. You can follow the developments here with hashtag our black hole or hashtag SGRA black hole. Our black hole is probably a little easier to spell. Uh, this comes in from the Event Horizon uh, Telescope. This has been a, a long time uh, in the making getting this direct image. But it raises the question, how did we know to look for this thing? How did we know that there was supposed to be a black hole in the center of our galaxy? After all, by definition, a black hole is something you can't really see because it's black against the black backdrop of space and black on black is kind of a difficult color combination to make out, especially tens of thousands of light years away. Well, the way we know that there needs to be a black hole at the center of our galaxy is because of what we know about the gravitational force. Quick reminder, the way gravity works in space, it's not a constant 9.8 newtons per kilogram downward because it's not constant and there is no down. Instead, what you have is a variable magnitude of the force that depends on the mass of the two objects being attracted to each other and the square of the distance going in the denominator there. So the farther away you get, the weaker that force of gravity becomes. And then in terms of direction, it always points toward the other object. It's always attractive. It always moves them toward each other and so the only way you can avoid colliding because of this gravitational force is to get enough velocity to rotate around the, the, the heavier object, right? And so we as a planet are constantly following, falling toward the sun. We just happen to have the right velocity to go around instead of getting closer to it and ending the earth in a, in a fiery disaster. Well, that type of motion is how we know that there should be something supermassive and invisible at the center of our galaxy. This is one of my favorite videos. Uh, this is data collected over the span of, I believe, 15 years, going from 1994 to 2007. This is observations of stars near the center of our galaxy. So we point our telescope toward the center of the galaxy, we record the motion of these stars, and what you end up with are these really cool, very sharp, very rapid orbits. Um, I know it, it, you know, the year up here makes it seem like it's it's taking a while, and so on a human scale it does. But really, on a astronomical scale, this thing, this star is whipping around here, and so what you've got here is a star that whips around in this pretty distinct pattern. It's whipping around in an ellipse. You notice it gets way faster down here. It's much slower up here. And the question becomes, well, why is it doing that? Why are these stars swarming around the center of the galaxy, right? It looks like it's under the influence of gravity because that one over r squared law means you will end up with an ellipse when things are orbiting each other. This is definitely an ellipse. It definitely looks like gravity. Gravity is the only force that's long range enough to act over these distances, but gravity requires something to attract it, right? There needs to be something in the lower focus of this ellipse here in order for the star to whip around like that. There's got to be something there, but I, I maybe I need to turn up the brightness on my screen, but I don't see anything there. So there must be something that is supermassive that uh, exerts a very strong gravitational force, that's the same thing as being supermassive, but that also doesn't emit any light. Well, that's the prime description for a black hole, and it turns out this is what black holes look like, at least under this type of telescope looking at the, 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 the mass that's, that's around it, that's accelerating toward it. And so we can actually simulate this behavior using a computational model. We're going to pull out two important pieces of information from this video. One is the size of this orbit. You notice we've got a little link scale for 10 light days 
in the upper right corner here. So that gives an idea of how large this ellipse is, both across and vertically, vertically in space, vertically on the screen, right? Uh, but then we also have an idea of the time. We've gone from 1994 to 2007 to about, well, November 2006, it looks like. So that should be about 13 years. So we need about 13 years and about 10 light days tall, maybe four light days wide. So what you can do with that, you can go over to this simulation here. And as always, this will be available in a link in the description below. Uh, what we're going to do is create a star and create a black hole. Uh, we have no idea what uh, values to put in here. So we've put in our best guesses here. So we're going to put the black hole at 000, center of the galaxy. We're going to put the star uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 14 meters away. We're using that based on our scale of, what was it in, light days here. So one light day in meters is about 2.6 times 10 to the 13. So if I want it to be about 10 light days, uh, then that needs to be round about uh, 2.6 times 10 to the 14. I could have multiplied that by 10 in my head, I guess. Uh, so we've got just shy of that number times 10 to the 14, just as a nice round number to start with. Uh, I've estimated the starting velocity at, uh, let's see, this is half of 1 100th of the speed of light, 1.5 times 10 to the 6. Uh, given a mass of 4 times 10 to the 30, just to get it in the right ballpark for the order of magnitude there. And the mass of the black hole, this is the thing we're interested in, because in order to get the simulation to match that video, uh, we need to uh, pay attention to the mass of Sagittarius A star. And when you run this thing, what's going to happen is that you'll get the star going around the black hole. We've got the star going this way, the black hole right here. And I've set this up. I'll show you how I did this in a second. But I've set this up so that it only completes one revolution. So we don't have it keeping going around and around. So there's one revolution. Uh, we've got a size that's a little too squat, right? It needs to be stretched out vertically a little bit. So it's not quite... Uh, a full 10 light days there. I'm just, you know, using the, I'm just using the, the size of the stick on the screen to measure that. Uh, and then it's got a period of just over seven and a half years. So we want a period of about 13. So we're about, it's going around about twice too fast. So the way this simulation works is uh, we're going to run as long as we haven't done a complete loop. So basically we're going to run while theta is less than two pi because two pi radians, that's one complete loop. That's going to keep track of uh, whether we've gone, you know, a complete revolution there. I've also set it up based on the, uh, the distance from the original. So it's also checking while we are uh, uh, while, while we are sufficiently changing the R value till we get back to that original position there. So the way we do this, we're going to calculate the, uh, the force on each of these objects. We're actually currently not accelerating the black hole because we're just, we're just taking this in the frame of the black hole there. Uh, but we're going to calculate the star's force. We're using that with the g-force command. This is something I created uh, several years ago in the series uh, Let's Build a Solar System. A uh, very popular series on this channel if you want to go check that out. A lot of great activities for your students there. So the first thing we can do is set the universal gravitation constant. Now, you know me. I am a very much a fan of setting fundamental constants to one and just having funny units, but we want this to match the real world. So we have to use our real world value of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Next step is to calculate the separation distance. That's the R in gm1, m2 over R squared. This is the value that's going to go in there. Uh, we calculate the magnitude of the force using that equation, gm1, m2 divided by magnitude of the separation vector squared. Uh, you notice we're just referencing our two objects here, our, our, our sun and our black hole, excuse me, our star and our black hole. Uh, so that's the mass of object one, the mass of object two. Then we need to turn this thing into a vector. So we're going to use the magnitude of the force times the unit vector, the hat of that separation vector. And I've gone ahead and incorporated the negative here. Usually this would be uh, R1 minus R2, and then you would take negative of that to get the direction. Well, I figured just flip them there in the subtraction anyway. Um, so that's how we're getting that force vector there. And then we're going to, in each step of this loop, we're going to update the star's velocity. Oh, I guess we are updating the black hole's position. Okay, well, it ain't moving by much <laughs> because it's much more massive than the star is. Uh, so we update the star's velocity. This is just Newton's second law rearranged to get the change in velocity. So that's force over mass times a change in time. Then we're going to do the same thing here with the star's position. I'm not sure why I put parentheses around that. I think I'm allowed to remove those. 
find out if the simulation breaks. Uh, and then we'll update theta, we'll update r so that we can tell whether we need to end the uh, to end the orbit there. And so every time I run this, I can change these initial conditions, right? I can change the position of the star, the velocity of the star, and the mass of the black hole. So I'm interested in finding the mass of the black hole. That's, that's the physical thing that is of interest to this system here. So you might play around with each of those values. Um, let's see, let's try changing the black hole. Let's increase its, its mass by a factor of 10. Let's see if that gets us closer to or farther away from uh, that is definitely not what we saw in the video. Uh, it's actually getting sucked into the black hole at that point. That is much too quick of a period. So I would need to decrease it instead of increasing it. So instead of 10 to the 7, let's go with 10 to the, excuse me, 10 to the 37. Let's go with 10 to the 36. Okay, it's definitely taking a longer time. Uh, but the star is kind of wandering off there, right? Uh, I, I don't think we've got our, our nice elliptical orbit there. And so this is the kind of thing you want to play with. You want to play around with this value here, the mass of the black hole, but you can also adjust the initial position of the star, so you can make it farther away or closer, and you can adjust the initial velocity of the star. And the way we know this is going to work is because we've got three parameters we can play with. We've got three degrees of freedom, initial position, initial velocity, and mass of the black hole, and we have three outputs that we want to match. We want to match the vertical dimension of this ellipse, we want to match the horizontal dimension of this ellipse, and we want to match the amount of time that it takes to make one orbit. So if you want three numbers in the output, you need three numbers in the input that you can play around with. However, there is one more thing that I need to do in order to update this simulation. That's to actually make it hashtag our black hole instead of just a gray orb of mystery because now we know what it looks like. I don't need to have just a mystery orb out there in my simulation. I can now make this our black hole. So what I've done is uploaded our black hole image to Imgur. I've got the JPEG link here because what you can do in WebVPython formerly GlowScript. Uh, what you can do in WebVPython is take this JPEG link, copy paste it here into the black hole's texture. So I've commented out the color. We're not going to make it gray anymore. We're now going to give it this texture with hashtag our black hole image. Let's go run this program. And there it is right in the center, our black hole. There it is, folks. It is now our simulation with our black hole. Now we just have to get the dimensions and the period correct.